uh, Tucson Convention Center. We're here with Alan Trano, the organizer and host of this show, who has uh, set up the inaugural Arizona Science and Astronomy Expo here at the Tucson Convention Center. And Alan, I wanted to ask you, just what does it take to put on a show like this? It's a lot of effort. Um, it normally takes about a year of planning to pull off a show of this magnitude. Uh, I was able to do it in four months. Uh, a lot of support from local. I have a company here in town, work my employees to the bone. My partner assisted me greatly. Uh, I couldn't have done it without him. Uh, but it's a lot of work, a lot of planning every single day, hundreds and hundreds of emails a day. Uh, sometimes going in, turning the computer on and just not even wanting to look at it. Um, I did have some issues right before I came here. Two weeks before the show, I had no email or electricity, so I was being from New Jersey. A lot of us are still without, with, still without power, so there was a nightmare for me. Uh, basically, a week before the show, I almost lost my mind. But thank God, my cell phone worked, and I was able to switch stuff around. And, uh, and I actually left home with no power. So. Uh, and like everybody else on the East Coast, that Hurricane Sandy did a lot of damage, and there's probably a lot of people who aren't making the show. I hope you. I hope everybody is slowly returning to normal. Yeah, I hope I so really too. Do. And that those who didn't make the show uh, can next year, because I know I'm, I'm pretty sure you're going to do this again, aren't Absolutely. you? Absolutely, we'll be back. The, res the response from everybody, the local people, the town, the facility, overwhelming. And the speakers, so the happy. speakers have been fantastic. Yeah. I mean, you've had some wonderful speakers, astronauts, you've had scientists, you've had. The all these people who are all really all part of the, the professional side. Absolutely. Not just the, now this show is really kind of targeted towards the amateur astronomer, albeit you know modern equipment and astronomy has become so sophisticated that these days there really isn't an amateur anymore. Everybody has the professional capabilities. But in setting up a show like this, I mean you're dealing with NASA. I mean, Look at the display we have behind us. Is this a NASA display? These are all, we have uh, seven NASA displays, all of them right from ordered right from NASA. Um, we were able, my company was able to uh, become close with NASA. Uh, I own Lund Solar System. We provided all of the H-alpha, calcium, and white light filters for NASA for their Venus transit. We adapted all of their cameras. Went to Hawaii on the mountain, became very friendly with NASA Edge Television. That got us a real good in. They are also here filming the whole weekend right now. That opened up doors. Our vendors are wonderful. They are gracious. I needed some sponsors. All of these displays are being sponsored by the vendors. Wonderful. Yes. Now, is the turnout for the crowd uh, meeting your expectations? I, of course, I would always like another 100,000 people here. First year, I'm very happy. I mean, no one knew what to expect, what the response was going to be. So, we're very happy. Good. Well, I've noticed that there's an awful lot of children here, and that's an amazing part. I, some of the displays, and one of them upstairs is the children's room. We filmed it yesterday with all the kids and their hands-on displays, playing with science, and, and it was a, a remarkable part of you, your... You hit on it before. The amateurs are have become almost professional. Uh, one of my emphasis is promoting science and astronomy to our youth. I don't need to promote astronomy to most of our attendees who are in that exhibit hall looking at the high-end equipment. Yeah, they know all the, about yeah, it. You're preaching to the choir there. Exactly, and exactly. Yeah. And, um, and then you got the International Dark Sky Association held their annual general meeting here in yes. conjunction with the show. Right, they had a whole program also. And they had their own program as well. So this has been a dynamic show. What do you say we walk into the show and just Absolutely. Around? Let's go see do what that. it looks like. Shall we? Come on. Here, now I heard Alan mention he owns one. Solar system. Solar system. We make. Uh, this is I, behind I, us here, isn't it? This, 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 this I, need, I need it to be close to my my <laughs> office, my registration room. Uh, we make hydrogen alpha telescopes for studying the sun. Yeah. Now we were out, out front with all the solar scopes, and of course, sitting out there, dauntingly, was the big 230 millimeter. The world's largest commercial solar telescope made by your company. Yes. It is. Oh, wonderful, wonderful thing. Well, let's take a quick look. You want to take a quick look at lunch stuff? Why don't you show us? Come on, let's take a look. Um, let's see what we got here. This baby is, this is our, used to be our big baby until the 230 was made, but this is our, I would say our largest standard telescope. This is a 152 or a 6 inch hydrogen alpha. It also has the ability to be switched out or swapped out 
where you can actually remove the module for height and alpha, like so. And there is a whole other module that goes in that it would allow you to use calcium. Uh -huh. Or another module that you would put in, you could use it as a nighttime telescope. Oh, for goodness sake, so actually it's a, will. it actually has three purposes. Now, do you have to take out the energy rejector filter to be able to use it? Not at all. Everything is built in the modules. Oh, uh, everything is in the module. Look at that. Oh, so it's a very sake. dynamic, a very dynamic product. Very Incredible. different, very yeah. diversified. And actually, with one scope, I mean, you've got three bases covered all in one. Okay? These are now our, some of our newer products. These are uh, some smaller app, um, refractors, and these are made to accept our calcium wedges, okay, and our white light wedges. So you can use, use these for white light viewing sunspots, calcium. A lot of people can see it, a lot of people don't see calcium. It depends on a lot of people. Very, very difficult. Very, yes. Well, not, I love it. Okay, My it's partner purple, does not it? like it. I see a lot of detail. Um, and you can also use these telescopes nighttime, although we're really not into the nighttime market. You guys are solar scopes. So yes, I mean, exactly. You do hydrogen alpha exactly. is what you're famous for, yeah. So we come over here, a couple of other pro products. I would say this is our this is our number one baby. This is a 60 millimeters, the perfect entry level telescope. For, I own this one. I have one of these, double stacked. Yeah, I have the same one. I love it. <laughs> I love it. This is a great scope. It's a grab and go, which means you can put it on a small tripod. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about it is it takes 10 seconds to set it up. Unscrew the caps. You're you're viewing. A minute or two later, you want to go back inside. You pick it up. You bring it inside. An hour later, in and out. We make front-mounted filters for almost every telescope. The one that's catching my eye now, this one here with the double pressure tuners. Now this is an, an invention that actually is a lot of invention, yes, isn't it? it? Is. And this is a, a, a system where the etalons change their wavelength uh, bandpass by pressurizing a chamber with air. Changing the index of refraction of the air between the etalons. You see how technical it is. The index refraction, just like how you stick a straw in water and the straw bends, air has that same property at different pressures, it changes. Exactly. So, so now this telescope, instead of having one etalon, like this telescope here, with one pressure cylinder, this one has two etalons. So double stack rather than on the front, this is on the back. Now does this uh, decrease the amount of uh, sweet spot uh, that you get with the tilting etalons? You get a, a little tiny bit. Front mounted filters are much more expensive. This is an inexpensive way to double stack a telescope. Oh. A full aperture front mounted filter can cost as much as a whole telescope. Ah, okay, and I that's see. That's the problem because it has to be full aperture. Full aperture, okay? that's right. That's the whole thing. I see. So like so your you 60 right. has a 35 millimeter uh, etalon in here, but you have a front mounted 60 or 50? 50. 50. I have a 60 on the front. The 60 and the 50s cost almost as much. Supposed to be down there. Oh, I'll be darned. Wow. Because wait. it's very expensive to make end lots. Yeah. And yeah. the bigger they are, the harder they are to make, yeah. so on and so on. So the 230, which you don't have here, it's out front. That to make that scope, that was, it must have been well, incredible. It, it is. I mean, think of a 9 inch object. Yeah, it's crazy. It's nuts. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, this is fantastic. Well, let's just walk along yeah, and let's look at some of their vendors. Okay, we're here at the OPT booth, and Alan's going to introduce the Oceanside Photo and Telescope Shop. Now, that's near us in California, down near uh, San Clemente, Oceanside. And I got to tell you what, it's one of the nicest shops you can go in. I mean, you can spend hours ogling at all the great toys. Isn't that right? Your shop is something. I'd like to introduce my dear friend and one of the probably one of the strongest advocates of amateur astronomy in the world is my dear friend Craig Weatherwax. Craig, Craig has supported me for so many years. He's my go-to guy. Anytime I need something up and above, he's never said no to me. It um, cost me a fortune to say no. <laughs> I like to say no every once in a while, but I can't. Yes, you I'm can. Very, very persuasive guy. Uh, but OPT ha is a phenomenal dealer. They're a full service dealer. They carry every manufacturer. Their staff is super dedicated. They are knowledgeable. They probably have one of the best teams in the business. And 
they have that because they must have a phenomenal boss, and they do. Yeah. <laughs> I like to have fun what we're doing. That's what we like to do. We like, like to have fun, and make sure you guys have fun too, for sure. And he's all about um, spreading astronomy to our youth, also. Absolutely. So that's what it's all about. Every day here. That's absolutely true. Sure. So. Oh, that's terrific. Just take a scan of his booth, uh, Leonard, and just show all the gear he's brought with him today. And are you having a good show? All the way from New Jersey is a good friend of mine, Rob Teeters. Rob is Rob Teeters has some of the most beautiful Dobsonian telescopes that are available out there. And Rob is probably came the furthest of any of the United States vendors, all the way from no power, snowy New Jersey. <laughs> is there anything special you'd like to point out about your scope? Um, well, yeah, I mean, we do a couple different things that some of our competition doesn't do. Uh, well, first of all is our cherry stain that we do, so that's, that's a little bit different. Other people do more of a, a like a brownish, yellowish stain, more run of the mill. This is more, you know, with the brass fittings and the black board where it's more aesthetically pleasing uh, than some of the other telescopes out there. Uh, we also do uh, our boundary layer cooling things oh, okay. as well, which nobody else really addresses. You've got this boundary layer of warmer air sitting on top of the primary mirror, uh, which, like heat waves coming off the blacktop in the summer, really messes up the view. Light comes in, gets bent, refracted, and by the time it gets to the eyepiece, it's all pushed by that point. So by turning on the fans that walk across the face of the mirror, you're introducing a nice cool layer of air to disrupt that uh, turbulent layer of air. And then the image is much better, much quicker. You know, so you're observing way before the, the other guys are. So what size is this telescope? Uh, this is an 18 inch. This is an 18. How big do you, uh, do you build? Uh, we're up to 22. Up to 22 inches. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty good. And then this looks like it's probably, what, an F6 telescope, something like that? Actually, it's only uh, an f4.5. 4.5. Okay. Yeah. So do you work on the shorter focal lengths mostly? Is that what you do? Uh, nowadays, the market's definitely going in that direction. Okay. A lot of guys want to go, to go below f4, f3, f3 and a half, mm. 37 to keep that eyepiece height. You know, here for like 20 inch or 18 inch. I see. So a lot of seated observing. And then I see you have your wheels and everything and the rest of your equipment that's for moving the scope around and transporting it. Exactly, yeah. Wonderful. You want these telescopes to be as portable as possible. You, know, you don't want it to be a burden for someone to have to take it out and set it up. And, because then they're not going to want to actually set it up. It's not going to get used. You know, it looks like furniture. It's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Another, another thing I'd like to mention is Rob is here with his lovely wife, Heather. And Heather has her own little sidelines. Heather uh, does the shroud. Sure, I make any of the fabric components. So the shroud prevents light coming in from the side, getting uh, the image muddied by strenuous light. Uh, so it's just spandex. Goes on easy and off, um, and it's tight, so it fits exactly around. It doesn't move during the night. It's um, it pulls moisture, so it doesn't drip inside. Doesn't drip down it. Um, so I also do cases for the poles. When these poles come out, nice case to carry all of them together, and also caps to put on top to protect against dust. It's really a pleasure meeting you, Robert. Yeah, you too. And yeah, you Thanks. too, Heather. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a pan around and let's see what there is to see.
lot of activity here today. activity. And there's Starzona's booth that we uh, saw the other day. Scott Cardell. Thanks for the school project. The club project. Like I said, I'm self-taught. Well, there you go. That's a, uh, oh, there you go. Yeah. We're coming up with Molly Pohoka's booth. And there's Wally. Thank you, Dean. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Such a pleasure. Thank Absolutely. You. Thanks, fellas. Thank you very much. Have Thanks for coming by. It sure is a pleasure to meet you, Randy. It's right, been a moment with you. And oh. Thanks for sharing with everybody. You're but trust me, these guys could pull bells and whistles out that blow your mind. Trust me. But anyway, thanks, guys. <laughs> IDA. That's what I got to say. Thank